we the people, we the taxpayers, we the Tea Party people, what can we do for solutions to help start moving these teachers and, and, and be a pillar of support to them to help them have a voice against this propaganda Marxist left? Well, there's, there's a, it's got to be a multifaceted approach. And the key thing is, and I know it's tough in Illinois, but you've got to eventually aim to make Illinois a right-to-work state. <laughs> you know, and I know that's not... That, that, that would be ultimately... Yeah, and that's yeah. got to happen eventually. But until that happens, you've got to support, you've got to find real, decent, patriotic, conservative teachers who are willing to stand up. And then you've got to form groups who will back them. And you've got to get legal support for them too, because they will run into legal problems. You've got to find people who are willing to buck the system. And then you've got to get a group of people around them who will financially support them and legally support them. They can't to take afford on to the lose industry. their jobs. Well, exactly. That's why you they need the legal afford, support. Because I've yeah. talked to many, many teachers, many, many teachers, and they see it and I hear stories, but it's like, can we do some stuff? Well, I, you know, I can't. I, they have food they have to put on their own table. Exactly. So the teachers themselves right now in the position they're at, they can't. But there's a lot of patriots, a lot of Tea Party groups. What specifically could they do to help start building the infrastructure yeah. so the teachers can then feel like they're empowered? Well, one of the big key things is obviously to, to get Tea Party people into the school boards. Mm -hmm. You know, so that the Tea Party people can directly confront the unions and negotiate with the unions from a very, from a position of strength. And that's going to take a lot of guts and a lot of effort. But that's, look, there's several approaches. You've got to get, Illinois has got to become right to work. The, the, the conservatives and patriots have to take over the school boards. But you also have to find conservative teachers who are willing to stand up and back them financially and legally. So there's three layers to this. We and have also got to involve parents and PTAs and, and <laughs> educating them into what is actually going on in their schools so that they put pressure as well. So the unions have got to be pressured from every single angle. We, uh, we recently had uh, Sharon Engel on who ran against oh, yeah. Terry Reid in Nevada. Nevada. Yeah. Now, Nevada is a right-to-work state, yeah. but she, she told us that the problem that they encounter with the unions there is substantial. It's, it's not an easy task, even in a right-to-work state. Sure. The problem in Illinois is, first you've got public education, which is a monopoly, yep. mm. and then you've got the union, which is a monopoly within a monopoly. Yep. You don't tinker with this unless they let you, and if they let you, then they're letting you be a part to say that we've reformed this. But the truth is, they have no interest in reform. They're, they are going to continue as long as they... Uh, uh, continue to buy off politicians and the politicians do whatever they want. Yeah. We're going to continue to drive America into the ground. Well, let's but, face it, this yeah. has been going on a very long time. So <clears throat> this is not going to change in one election cycle, in two election cycles. No. Mm. This is going to be a progressive movement yeah. to yeah. the right. In, in the real sense. Yeah. In the real sense. It's yeah. going to take changing the hearts and minds of, of people and telling the people the truth. But you don't just tell somebody the truth without substantiating it and giving yeah. them facts. Because if I tell you something, you're going to say, that's very nice, Carol. <laughs> but if, if, if I tell you something and give you resources so you can use your own mind and your own heart to research this, then once you intrinsically own this, yeah. now it becomes something that is more owned by you. That is changing the hearts and minds. Yeah. And how do the grassroots actually, how can we reach out and just create a dialogue to open people's minds to seek the truth and have people seek, seek these answers on their own so they can intrinsically own it. Well, I think this thing's not the movie Agenda is a great resource for, for, for awakening people up who know there's something wrong but don't really know what. The so, movie Agenda is very, very excellent yeah. specifically for churches yeah. because we've showed the movie Agenda in a church format and a, a non-church format. And the church format, it resonated. All the information in there is true, but the, that was that is a very good thing for evangelical churches. But to I, also, be I also think it'll be great to get into the black churches as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing, the other way you can reach to a lot of the black communities is through the charter school movements 
and the homeschool movement because a lot of black parents are disgusted at the level of education their kids are getting. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, they really, really are. It breaks their hearts. So that is another way you can get to the black and less affluent communities by harping on the education issue. You know, do you want your kids to get the best education possible so they can rise out of the poverty of your community? And, and, and it's not easy, but these are the things you have to do. You know, I want to just say something, because I remember when Barack Obama was sworn into office. I, I did not vote for Barack Obama because I did get some of the wins of the Jeremiah Wright, and I was sending out emails, well, you know, who is this Barack Obama? Can we look into who he is more? But I have to tell you, to watch a an African-American man and his beautiful family being sworn into the White House that was a great thing. It was wonderful because I grew up in the 60s. I remember the race riots in 1968. I remember Dr. Martin Luther King. And I, I, I never grew up in a racist environment. So to see that, it was I felt that this could potentially be a wonderful opportunity of healing, to start a healing process for this nation. Uh, exactly, and that's why so many people voted for him. Yes, because it was, and I would have Historic. loved. Historic, yeah, you know, and and I even I could, you know, I thought, well, I knew his background, but I thought at least it might have that effect, and it was. It inspired so many people, and it gave black people a lot of pride. Yes, and a lot of white people a lot of pride too, because they thought, well, this is a, a healing thing for America. Also, the fact the black community to see somebody rise to the office mm. of president of the mm. United States, you want to talk about hope and giving someone something to look forward to and, and, and goals and opportunities that says so much about this country. And he took it and pushed a completely different agenda, didn't pr mm. help to create any policy to promote jobs, didn't create any policy to help help make America better. Yeah. It was Marxist health care. It was Marxist the environmental. Mm. <sighs> it's, it's been a major betrayal, to be honest, you know, to put it bluntly, because he offered so much hope and so much change, and the hope and change that people were looking for was not Marxist socialism. It was no. not more government control. It was empowerment. It was rising out of the ghetto. Yes. It was rising above. It was, it was a, an aspirational thing. And he has done everything in his power to turn that around. I wouldn't necessarily call it a betrayal. I believe I, you know, and I'm not a brain, but it didn't take a whole lot for me to come to the conclusion that this guy is not good for America. He talked about hope and change. But Michael, he was a marketing magnificence. He said, we want to heal America. We want transparency. His words were so beautiful and fluid. And re I could see yeah. where this wolf in sheep's yeah. clothing could influence people. He was young. He was good looking. I, young I, listened, well, I, listened to, I listened to the speeches. They were empty. They yeah. they had absolutely no substance no, no, to them. No, they had the they had the healing, the hope, and the change. It was a positive message. The rhetoric was positive. Yes. The actual message didn't lack lacked a lot of specifics. There's no meat. But people put their meaning because they were crying out for hope. They were crying out for change. They were crying out for reconciliation. And he tapped into that. Yep. But his whole agenda was a betrayal of that. Yes. A betrayal of everything that yes. would actually achieve those things. Yes, especially for I agree with those that. most neediest people, yeah. those people that are living below the poverty level. In America, 43% of Americans live below poverty. Yeah. Since his presidency, 47% of Americans are on food stamps. And now, has, he, has he grown the economy so those 40s, those 40% 40 plus of unemployed black teenagers can get a job? No, he hasn't. No. He's, he's made it worse. So all the people who his base of support has actually suffered, they're worse off now, and they're going to be a lot worse off again if he gets re-elected. Well, I've that always, is a betrayal, in my opinion. Yeah, I've always maintained that, uh, you know, people want to say he's liberal, he's a socialist. I believe all of his policies were about power. I believe he's been looking to duplicate what the Democrats have done in Chicago by by getting a hold of these large interest group bases that they, they flood them with money to get people dependent upon yeah. government. 
Look, because you're always going to vote for the side that your bread is buttered on. The whole thing about the health care, which was designed, look, both Romney Care and Obamacare were designed by a Marxist, a man called John McDonough out of uh, Harvard University, former chairman of Boston Democratic Socialists of America. And he designed both Obamacare and Romney Care. Democratic, the communists have openly stated in some of their publications, the reason they want socialized health care is nothing to do with health care. Yeah. It is about, they, they go back to Britain in the 1940s. In the 1940s, most working class British voted, voted conservative. But in 1946, with the Beveridge Report and the National Health Service, that, that socialized health care shifted the British working class from the conservatives to the Labour Party the equivalent of your Democrats. And that's exactly what health care is about to now. They want to get everybody dependent on socialised health care so they will not bite the hand they f that feeds them. They want to shift them into the Democratic Party camp, which is controlled by the Marxists. Kind of like Andy Stern, workers of the world unite. Exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a trap to get people dependent on the state, dependent on the Democrats. Look, look Miguel de Val, I'll give you another example. Immigration, illegal immigration. There are 12 million illegal immigrants in this country. There's a woman. There's a man out of uh, the deputy head of SEIU, um, Alessio Medina. He's, a, he's the executive vice president of, of SEIU. He's the biggest immigration activist in this country. A member of Democratic Socialists of America. I've got him on tape saying that they want to legalise 12 million, 12 million illegal immigrants in this country because they reckon it will give them eight, more Democratic Party, 8 million more Democratic Party votes. And that's, he says that, nothing to do with the rights of immigrants. He openly states the reason we want to do it is because of 8 million more votes for the left. Right. Sure. Well, you know and what I find to be so do. ironic? These, these illegal immigrants come here illegally for a free America, yeah. and they are being hoodwinked, hoodwinked yeah. by these progressive democratic socialists. One other point, Hugo Chavez and Barack Obama in our oil, is that... Um, is there any reason why we're not drilling in America and why we are giving these these countries the free reign to <laughs> drill for their oil? Well, the left hates the idea that America could be energy independent. Because if you're not energy independent, you are reliant on other countries. Now, Hugo Chavez is a Marxist dictator allied with both Russia and China mm -hmm. and Cuba. So Obama who has been brought up, surrounded by pro-Cuban, pro-Russian, pro-Chinese Marxists, is giving his friend the right to drill oil off your coast, but he's doing everything he can to shut down your, your domestic energy industry. Because that's ultimately going to burden the American it's gonna, people. It's going gonna, it's gonna to drop the American economy, make it harder for you guys to get ahead. If you could drill your own oil, everybody would be driving around in cars, you'd be having $2.50 gas instead of $3.50 gas. It's $4.25 well, right now. <laughs> whatever, you'd, you'd halve the price of gas. That would help every poor person in this country, every individual in this country. There'd be so much more money to spend. Every shop would do better. Every restaurant would do better. Every business would do better. The scoreboards would have more money. Everybody would be better off. But they don't want to do that because they want to impoverish American Americans to keep them dependent. And the other reason they want to impoverish America, and this is a real reason, because that gives them an excuse to cut your military to ribbons, mm. which they're now doing, and that leaves your country open to your enemies.